All right. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Mike, and I'm a director here at Articulate. As most of you probably know, Articulate is a leading developer of online training software like Articulate 360 and our recently released all-in-one online training system called RISE. We also have the training industry communities, uh, or training industry's largest community, I should say, uh, with more than 800,000 members. What some of you might not have known up until now is that Articulate slash Rise is a fully remote company, and we have been since our founding in 2002. We all work from home, and we always have. So as a result, uh, we've learned a lot over the years about how to remote work well, and we're excited to share those insights with you today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to share a few notes about this Zoom webinar. Um, Zoom has been a really reliable app for us, but we do have over 10,000 people uh, scheduled for this webinar. So uh, we checked with Zoom to make sure that everything is gonna go well and we're pretty confident that it's going to, but please bear with us if this unprecedented number of people causes any wonkiness. We also received nearly 1,000 questions during registration. And at the end of the webinar, we are going to do our best to answer the most commonly asked questions that we received. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question during the webinar, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface and typing your question there. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so we will send you a link so that you can share it with any colleagues that you think could benefit from it. And at the end of the webinar, we will post a link to additional resources uh, in the chat, so hang around for that. Now, with that said, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Lucy Suros. Lucy is the president of Articulate and Rise, and she's just been so instrumental in shaping our growth from a small 50-person company in 2011 to our current team of hundreds of people working remotely from around the globe. Lucy's vision uh, of building an inclusive, human-centered organization is really what's powering our growth and innovation, and it's also led to really high employee retention and happiness. Plus, Lucy hasn't worked uh, in an office since 2001, so in short, she's an expert in remote work. So without further ado, I'm turning it over to Lucy. Hello, folks. I hope you can all see me now. Um, so I'm super happy to be here sharing uh, what we've learned about remote work with you all, and uh, I am sorry it's under these circumstances, however. This is really an unprecedented time in history um, and calls for us to be gentler uh, with ourselves and with one another as we navigate these new realities of work and life. I hope you are all taking really good care and washing your hands a lot. Uh, so I'm in California where everyone uh, not providing essential services must stay at home to slow the spread of coronavirus. Uh, you might be a, at a place where you're under similar orders or simply anticipating that it's coming. Whatever your current situation, um, I do firmly believe that the right thing right now is to empower your teams to work from home. Some analysts believe that we'll need to practice social distancing for up to a year. Uh, so getting wor remote work right now is not only urgent, it's also critical to writing this out as a business. Okay, so let's get started here. I am going to start sharing my screen and, oh no, I am sharing my screen. I believe I wasn't on camera before. So I know you might be feeling overwhelmed. Um, let me just check to make sure I'm sharing my screen. You're good, okay. I just got confirmation, I'm good. So I'm sorry I wasn't on screen um, earlier. I hope you can see me um, as well as my screen. So I know you might be feeling overwhelmed or even grumpy <laughs> that you're forced to go remote. Uh, so I wanted to share um, some silver linings about this new reality with you. And that's the fact that remote work is good for your team. Uh, my two decades of experience with remote work has proved to me that people who work from home um, are happier and they are for a whole host of reasons. They're not commuting two to four hours a day, which is a lot of time in your day to get back. They work in an environment that has the right temperature, aesthetics and noise level for them. It's a place of their own creation. They're less distracted by other coworkers and feel more productive. They save money because they're not eating out um, and commuting. And they stay healthier because they're not exposed to everyone's germs, which of course is super critical right now. 
As the leader of a human-centered organization, knowing that remote work is good for our employees is intensely gratifying to me, um, but it also has business benefits. Happy employees are more engaged, they're more productive, and they're more likely to stay at your company. Remote work can foster high-performing teams and results-oriented workplaces as well, um, which I'll go into in a little bit. Remote work also has um, benefits for the environment. Uh, just look at these NASA Earth Observatory images based on the European Space uh, Agency satellite. They show a remarkable drop in nitrogen uh, dioxide emissions after coronavirus hit China. And you can find similar images all over the web for Italy, uh, Seattle, and Los Angeles and other uh, places as well. So within just a few weeks of uh, people staying put, uh, pollution levels fell dramatically. As Mike noted in his introduction, uh, we're one of the first and largest fully remote companies in the US, and we've always been remote. We've never had an office. As our founder and CEO, Adam Schwartz says, we were remote before it was cool. Um, our entire way of working is architected around remote work. While our tools and processes have changed and evolved over time, uh, one thing that's really remained the same is that we've always been very intentional about setting our team up for success. Building a productive and happy remote work uh, workforce does take some planning um, and depending on your organization, some of the things um, I'm about to talk about might be profound shifts for you, but they are a worthy investment in creating a resilient, flexible organi organization and having happier, healthier employees. So the first shift you'll need to make may be the hardest for you. You need to start measuring people's output and not how many hours they're sitting in a chair. It's actually, when you think about it, pretty silly to think that just because someone is quote unquote at work, uh, they're producing work. They could be surfing the web, spacing out, planning the next vacation, you really don't know. Uh, but remarkably, even though we don't really know, companies still diligently track people's hours as a proxy uh, for productivity. In fact, they're so intent on tracking how many hours that people are sitting at their chairs, they will even spy on their employees uh, using services that automatically screenshot employees at their computers through webinars, or sorry, through webcams. Um, and I think this is just creepy and disrespectful. Um, so rather than finding ways to police your employees, uh, what you need to do is track whether they're producing solid work. Are folks fulfilling their job responsibilities? Are they collaborating effectively with their teams? It doesn't matter when, where, or how much time someone spends in a chair if they are producing good work. So I do get that for different roles, uh, different functions, and different types of companies, measuring output versus hours will look different. Uh, but I guarantee there's a lot more flexibility there than you might think at first um, if you're willing to get creative and really focus on what results you wanna drive. There's a great, a great book out there called Why Work Sucks and How to Fix It, The Results Only Revolution. It was written by folks who successfully implemented a results only culture at the retail company Best Buy, you might've heard of them. Um, it's well worth the read if you need a primer on uh, becoming results oriented. Now, in order to be results oriented, you need to know uh, what those results actually are um, that you're trying to drive. Before people can do work, they need to know what to work on. As a leader, it's your job to make sure everyone on your team understands exactly what work they're supposed to produce. And I'm really not talking abstractly here. Um, everyone on your team should know what deliverables they're responsible um, for, what outputs they're supposed to be producing. Job descriptions aren't enough. Annual plans aren't enough. People need to, be, need to know what they're supposed to be working on right now in the present moment. Um, managers, um, you need to set priorities and make sure your teams understand them. That's, that's up to you. And there are many ways to set priorities remotely. Again, this can be something driven by a manager, but it also can be something that is um, driven by the team together. Um, and across our Articulate and Rise businesses, teams typically meet weekly on Zoom uh, video conferences to screen share and prioritize GitHub or Trello boards, um, listing specific projects with tasks and deliverables. 
uh, I'll talk about the right um, or talk about choosing the right tech for your team in a little bit. So don't worry if what I just said was total Greek to you. So once folks know uh, what they're supposed to work on, they need to know how you expect to get the work done. A good rule of thumb in a remote environment is to over communicate and you're going to hear me say that over and over again over communicating that throughout this webinar. Uh, so even if you think you've said something a few times, say it again, make your expectations clear on how you expect work to get done. Unless you're explicit about your expectations, you might have someone um, gather a team of five for multiple rounds of ideation on something when all you really wanted was one person's quick, quick thoughts on something. And don't rely on verbal communication alone uh, in a remote environment. By all means, speak your expectations, uh, but then also write them down. A good practice is to document in writing expectations um, when you make an ask, uh, whether that's in Slack or in Microsoft Teams, Trello, GitHub, or another collaboration app. And I'll go uh, more into communication tips in a bit. When you're working remotely, it's also good to explicitly de delineate who needs to give feedback and approve remote work and how. Make sure everyone understands the process for moving work forward and document that process online so everyone knows. Um, this can be as simple as writing down who is supposed to review what and when uh, in a, a pinned Slack or Microsoft Teams post. Uh, and don't worry, I'll give you some more insight on best practices for those team chat apps um, in a minute. For more complex projects and programs, we do build the review process into our Trello and GitHub boards uh, so we can do visual handoffs that include email notifications to team members when a review is required or complete and more on that in a little bit as well. So it's easy to have confidence that people are getting stuff done uh, when you can see the progress on that work. In a remote environment, it's critical to make work visible. And how you make that work visible is less important of the fact that you're making that work visible. So for years, our remote team here was small enough that everyone just kind of had a sense uh, for what everyone else was working on and what the progress was on those key projects. But as our business has gotten more complex and interdependent, uh, we've had to improve our discipline around setting milestones, tracking progress, and updating people across teams and functions. And as we've done that, We've realized that had we done that earlier in our growth, we might have prioritized better and worked more efficiently, even though at the time it felt like we were moving as fast as we possibly could. So even if you have a small team, don't dismiss this best practice is my point. Another best practice for remote work is to expect folks to continue learning, iterating and improving. You don't have to get everything right the first time. No one does. We're all human. Uh, so what you want to do is create a safe space for your team to talk about what's going well and what is not going well on a project. This lets people build on their strengths while also giving room for them to pivot and try new and better approaches. So our teams will often have standing wins and losses agenda items uh, during our weekly video check ins uh, to build that kind of learning into um, into projects. We also do retrospectives, also commonly known as retros, after big projects uh, to dig deeper on where we excelled and where things broke down. Again, the intention is to learn and improve um, in our constantly evolving business. So to sum it up, you can set your teams up for success by shifting your mindset in a few key ways. Don't focus on hours, focus on results. Uh, that means you have to be clear about that about what those results will be. Uh, you have to track those results rather than hours, and you have to create envi an environment where your team feels safe enough uh, to brainstorm how to produce better and better results on every project. So besides changing your mindset around productivity and results, the number one thing, number one, you must focus on in a remote environment is communication. There are no water coolers, no hallways, no lunchrooms, and no chances to just gather information by osmosis when you're working remotely, which means that everyone from the top down needs to be highly, highly intentional about communication. I wish telepathy were a thing, uh, but since it's not, you really have to double down on communication in a remote environment. 
Your teams must absolutely plan their communication flows, deciding together what kinds of information needs to be shared, who it needs to be shared with, how it will be shared, and when it will be shared. And remember, people need to uh, hear things in multiple, multiple times in multiple ways, uh, so you need to plan for that. So for example, you might make it a practice to create and pin uh, a Slack or Microsoft Teams post in a group channel that records your decisions, action items, and updates that you've discussed in live video calls. Um, again, I'll go into more, more on using team uh, chat apps in a minute. You also need to remember that in the absence of information, people will naturally tell themselves and sometimes other stories um, to make sense of what they're observing. And that is totally human nature. We're all trying to constantly understand what's happening in our world. As you transition to remote work, remember that you need to tell people what you're doing and why you're doing it 10 more times more than you think you need to. So there's no such thing as over communication in a remote environment. I've never once in the history of the world heard have someone tell me, I really wish you had shared less information with me. While we've um, done quarterly all hand town meetings, um, town hall meetings for years, when I became president, it became clear to me that I needed to up our communication game. People needed to hear from leadership more often, uh, not only about big decisions, but just also what, what was happening in general across the business. So I began to do monthly president videos uh, where I talk to folks about what I'm seeing, uh, why we're making certain decisions, and how we're doing those uh, across our businesses. And in this time of uncertainty, I'm doing those videos almost weekly. I record myself on Zoom, by the way, if you're wondering how I do those, and then post them to Slack. People tell me um, that they love them um, and that because they know what we're doing and why uh, we're doing that at all times. And they don't have to guess or wonder so my advice to you is don't make your teams guess or wonder. My final communication tip in a remote environment is to make sure uh, your communication channels match the message and the purpose uh, for communicating. As much as we love Slack, our team uh, chat app, Slack uh, messages don't convey tone um, and people can read into text in all different kinds of ways. So what comes across as short, curt, or even angry to one person uh, that same message can come across as clear, concise, and helpful to another person. And if your purpose for communication is to discuss something, don't do it on team chat. It's way harder and takes longer to discuss things on team chat than to talk live in a video conference. A good rule of thumb is that if you're writing one or two quick paragraphs in your team chat, it's probably best to get on a quick call, or more than one or two quick paragraphs, I should say. Finally, if there's ever a conflict or confusion about something, make sure all parties hop onto a video call. And if feelings um, start running hot, or if you just sense that people are misunderstanding something, again, gather everyone right away pronto onto a video call. Um, I'm gonna talk more about modes of communication and collaboration on projects in a bit, but now let's shift gears for a minute and talk about what technology you'll need to empower your remote team. After I take some water. Okay, in a remote work environment, uh, using online apps that people can access anytime from anywhere <laughs> is a no-brainer. I know adopting new technology can appear daunting, uh, but most online, uh, modern online apps are really designed to be up and running in hours, if not minutes. And the best online apps are so intuitive to use that people can get started really quickly, even if they don't have tons of tech savvy. Okay, so let's talk about the key online apps uh, you'll need. I'll talk about the specific apps we use here, uh, but by all means, shop around if these don't quite work for you. So you're gonna make life so much easier for your remote team if you use cloud-based apps uh, to develop, share, and collaborate on documents, spreadsheets, and presentations. We use G Suite by Google and have for about a decade, and it served us very well. I know some companies and industries aren't able to move completely to the cloud, but if you can, you should. If you don't use online apps with your remote team, uh, you miss major, major problems with version control and may end up having multiple copies of the same document, spreadsheet, or presentation circulating around. Another benefit of online apps is that they're typically responsive, which means they look and work great um, on tablets, phones, whatever devices your folks are using. 
If G Suite is the backbone for our collaboration, team chat is the lifeblood of our communication. Uh, even though we've spent more than a decade um, chatting on Skype before the company was founded or after the company was founded in 2002, it's still hard to remember how we survived without Slack. In a modern remote environment, team chat is a must, um, absolute, absolute must, whether you're using Slack, uh, Microsoft Teams, or another team chat app. There's a reason that Slack usage has spread like wildfire in the last few years, and that's because it lets people collaborate and communicate in real time, makes it easy to disseminate info quickly to the right people, and it provides a way for people to participate in topical channels that um, foster community. If you're here with us live, uh, we all we will be sending this out to folks uh, recorded recorded um, version of this to folks who weren't able to attend but registered. But if you're here with us live, you've had the experience of um, signing on to Zoom to do this webinar. There are, of course, plenty of other video conferencing apps you can use, um, but based on trial and error, we found Zoom to be the best. We absolutely love it. It handles our company all town um, our all company town hall meetings with hundreds of attendees just as easily as it does one on one video calls and apparently 10,000 person webinars like this one. And I'll talk a little bit more on how to run an effective meeting uh, video meeting in just a minute. There are many online project management apps out there, so I'm going to just talk about the ones we found useful here. If you're a tech company, you're probably already using GitHub. Our engineers would be absolutely lost without it, and we use it to host and review code, as well as to manage engineering projects. To manage non-technical projects, we use Trello, uh, and that integrates nicely with Team Gantt, which is a great tool for planning and sequencing projects. We'll talk more about collaborating on projects in a minute as well. Finally, uh, you'll need to move your training uh, online. While people are ordered in many cases to stay home, um, with people ordered to stay home, you simply can't train in person right now. Um, plus, online training is way more cost effective and definitely safer right now than in-person training. We train all of our folks using our own all-in-one training system, Rise.com, uh, but of course, you might already have an online training system you're using. We are partial to Rise, not only because it's ours, uh, because, but because unlike most training platforms, people actually love using Rise. It makes online training uh, easy to create, uh, very enjoyable for learners to take, and it's super simple to manage. And, uh, and like the other online apps I've talked about here, it can be spun up in hours, if not minutes. And by the way, we created a free Rise course uh, to combat misinformation about uh, COVID-19. So um, we'll include a link to that in the resources that we'll share with you after this webinar. It's free, you can just check it out. So those are the core online apps we use here um, across our remote team. There are, there are of course many team specific apps that you'll wanna move online, but I focused on these because they're um, the ones that we simply could not operate rem remotely without. So you might be thinking that's great, but how do we get our team comfortable with new technology? So like I said, luckily, all the apps I've just mentioned here are super intuitive, so they're going to be easy for folks to learn. But if you want to speed up that learning, um, I recommend doing some super lightweight training. You can do this live via a Zoom video conference where you're sharing your screen like I'm doing here uh, with Teams and walk them through app basics. Or you can build a lightweight uh, course in a training system that includes video screencasts that, folks, um, that show folks what to do. And if you're not up and running yet on video conferencing or a training app, um, try sending out an email, uh, simple, low tech, uh, works too, uh, with links to how to videos on your new apps. You'll find that most uh, modern online apps have simple videos on using core features. And again, uh, check out the webinar resources uh, that we'll be sharing and it will have some links to get you started on the apps that we've talked about here. Uh, now that we've talked a bit about some of the mindset shifts, communication strategies and online apps you'll need for your remote team. Um, I'm gonna dive into some best practices for communicating, conducting meetings, collaborating with others, managing projects, and training your team remotely. So earlier I talked a bit about um, how important it is to be intentional about communication in a remote environment, and I cannot underscore that enough. Uh, so let's talk about how you can do that in real time effectively. Over the last few years, team chat apps have taken off for a good reason. They're great for real-time communication and a must for a remote team. 
We use Slack, but you might be using Microsoft Teams or something similar. We love Slack because it's super user friendly um, and your team will be able to get up and running in no time. And if you don't have team chat yet, um, I do recommend investing in Slack, even if you have a, a small team. Um, I did just look up their plans and they have some very affordable ones for smaller teams. Okay, so let's dig into some best practices for team chat. I'll be showing examples in Slack, but most of these apps uh, really have similar features, so the same tips uh, will apply. So the first thing you wanna do is to set up group channels for teams, uh, for key projects, and for company announcements. And of course, make sure you communicate <laughs> to folks what those channels are and what they should use them for. So what you're looking at here is a screenshot of the sidebar in Slack, uh, which shows what channels look like. And they're pretty similar in other team uh, chat apps. The channels with hashtags in front of them are public channels uh, that anyone can view if they belong to them. Um, and the ones with locks are private channels. So only people are, who are invited to private channels can see the content uh, there. A good practice is to encourage folks to communicate in public channels as much as possible. And that goes to my point earlier about making work visible and having transparent communication. Sometimes, though, uh, you might want to reduce the noise in public channels and do focus work um, with a smaller group in a private channel, and that's totally fine. Just make sure you're clear about expectations and a process for bringing the key updates of that work uh, to those larger public channels. Remember that when everyone's remote, it's a lot harder for news to spread informally, so you have to be really intentional, uh, intentional about it. There can be so much net messaging activity in Slack, it can be hard to keep up, but don't worry. This is easily solved by making sure your team uses proper notification etiquette. The core best practice here um, to think about here is to really think about who needs to get a message notification. So at channel um, notifies everyone in a channel of your message. So you wanna ask yourself before you post, is this a message for everyone really truly? Um, or should I at, at mention a specific person or at mention a specific team? To reduce noise, I recommend that you notify whole channels sparingly uh, so that people aren't getting constant pings on things that aren't urgent. And remember, even if someone isn't specifically notified, they can always uh, view the messages in a channel at their leisure. For all team chat apps, um, you're going to typically have control over your notifications so folks can choose how they want to be notified. You'll see here that I've chosen to be notified when someone sends me a direct message, they at mention me specifically in a channel, um, or they use one of the keywords that I've defined. I mentioned earlier um, that a good way to make sure your team stays on the same page is to create a Slack post and pin it to your channel. So let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. When you're in a channel, you can click on the paper clip um, and then choose create new post. You can then type whatever content you want into the post. Uh, so for example, you might capture the decisions and to-dos of the video call you just had with your team. And finally, you can pin that post to the channel, which makes it really easy to find uh, by people in the channel later. Again, in a remote environment, you wanna repeat communication in multiple ways and make that communication easy to access at any time. Okay, so let's shift gears and talk about how you run effective meetings on video. I'll be referring to Zoom here because that's what we know and love, but these tips really apply to any video call. So doing meetings on video may be uncomfortable for folks at first, especially uh, if you're doing uh, multi-person calls, which is the norm at our company, but rest assured it does get easier and people will get used to this new way of meeting quickly. And there's actually something quite nice about it since you get to see people in their personal environments. You can see my ukulele back there. Um, so it can actually feel more connecting um, than doing meetings in an office or a conference room. As I mentioned before, we love Zoom because it works really well for any size meeting, conference, or webinar like this one with thousands of attendees. And if you're a small team, there's great news for you. You can do free calls up to 40 minutes as long as you have under 100 people. Um, and you can have unlimited one-on-one -on -one calls for free on Zoom. I also looked that up for you all. So to get started, you'll want everyone to download the simple Zoom app onto their computer desktops, just like you did to join this webinar. Um, and then folks can create a meeting link that they can always use as their meeting room. Uh, so sending out the same link for every meeting. 
or they can create one off links for meetings if they'd like. Zoom integrates with Google Calendar and Slack too, um, and the Google Calendar integration makes it easy, easy to add as a, a meeting link right when you're creating your calendar event without leaving Google Calendar, and the Slack integration lets you start a Zoom meeting from Slack, uh, which is super handy. handy. So now let's talk about what to do once you're in a video meeting. Um, first of all, especially now when you're not seeing people in person, it's really, really important to be on camera. This allows you to not only connect in a more human way, um, but also to read people's body language and facial expressions, which are both super important layers of communication um, and importing, uh, communicating meaning and feeling. Being on camera may feel awkward at first, but you will get used to it. Um, plus, it forces you to shower and to dress every day, which is good for your mental and physical health. And if you happen to have some folks sitting into, a, go, still going into an office, so if you're operating sort of a hybrid work environment right now, um, they should still sign into the video meetings um, from their desks and not from with others from a conference room. So I cannot underscore this enough. It's a really horrible experience. Uh, to talk to folks around a conference table. They look tiny, uh, you can't read their facial expressions or body language, and the sound is typically horrible um, as well. Plus, if you all sign in for your, from your office desks, hopefully you'll be able to stay six feet apart um, as the CDC recommends. People might not know how and when to speak up on a video call, especially if the experience is new for them. Um, so you wanna make sure that you call on people um, or ask someone in the meeting to call on people um, and ask specific questions to make sure everyone's voice is heard. Um, and if you're in a stand up side type situation uh, where each person needs to share an update, it helps to call on folks that you don't have people starting to speak at once, which can be awkward. And speaking of awkward, uh, we joke a lot here about embracing awkward silences and you really just have to on video calls. Um, people often might need time to think before they speak. Um, and sometimes people can just struggle uh, to speak up on camera. So just sit with the silence if no one is speaking up right away and folks will typically jump in eventually. Uh, and some people are really just not comfortable speaking on camera, so they may prefer to use the Zoom chat feature during a call, which we embrace too. Um, and other people will need time to process what they've uh, heard and what you've discussed. So it's a good practice to invite folks to share feedback or thoughts later in another communication channel like Slack after a meeting. Video calls are great um, for collaborating live. And uh, often when we're on a video call, someone will share their screen and show the rest of the team a deliverable or explain an idea, um, wanting to get feedback. What you don't want to do is share your screen and end up sharing a whole lot more. Uh, the fact, um, like the fact that you're about to get to a divorce. Oops, Siri, Siri's talking to me. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, so before you get on video call, sorry, uh, clean up your desktop. Don't have folders or documents that you don't want others to see and close any apps that you don't want to inadvertently share and turn off all your notifications. And apparently um, you need to turn off Siri too, which I don't know how to do, but that would have been helpful. Even though Zoom allows you to share a specific app, um, everyone, I guarantee it at our company, has clicked the wrong app at least once when they're trying to share their screen. Um, and you don't want to mistakenly share a Slack conversation with your whole team that was meant for just your boss or your coworker. You should also clean up your browser bookmark bar. Um, this is not the time to show private content you might have sh uh, saved for viewing after work. Finally, when you're on a call with multiple people, ask folks to mute if they're not talking. That way you're not getting people's background noise, uh, which may be heightened right now, uh, especially with kids and other family members at home. So those are my top tips for doing video conferences. Uh, now let's talk about collaborating on projects. One of the most common questions uh, we get from people about remote work is, but how do you collaborate? And I always smile at this uh, because this is the most collaborative place I've ever worked. Uh, while you might not have um, a physical whiteboard when working remotely, you do have powerful tools for collaboration at your disposal. You can share your screen during video, um, during a Zoom meeting like I just talked about. You can work asynchronously together on documents, spreadsheets, or slides in Google. You can brainstorm ideas on a video call or in a, a group Slack channel. 
really the only limit to collaboration is your company's appetite for doing so. So if you're already highly collaborative, you'll have no problem finding the right apps to collaborate remotely. And if you're not collaborate, collaborative right now, then that's probably gonna continue as well. We collaborate in real time in all the ways I just mentioned, um, but we collaborate at a macro level on projects using GitHub and the project management app Trello. Again, you might be using a different project management app um, or multiple apps, but the core features of these types of apps are similar. Uh, so these tips will still be useful, I hope. Project management apps let you track elements of, of a project and collaborate with others. And many apps like Trello use visual boards to do that. Here's an example of a Trello board for a marketing campaign. Uh, you can see that the board is comprised of lists and cards in each list. You can add descriptions um, and checklists to cards, assign people to cards so they know they're responsible for completing a task, and even have conversations in cards. We will often ask questions in cards, post deliverables to cards, and tag people for reviews in cards. It's really easy to show the priority of tasks um, in Trello by dragging and dropping cards into the right order. We organize cards in the highest priority from top to bottom in a list. For recurring projects, it can be handy to create a template board um, that you can copy and then tweak by project. Um, on their blog, uh, Trello also has some great project uh, board templates you can copy and adapt easily. So now that I've given a brief overview of Trello, I wanna dig into a few best practices for managing projects remotely, whatever, your, um, whatever collaboration apps you're using. So the first one is to make sure that every project has a clear owner, uh, however you define that. The key is that one person is empowered to push projects forward. In a remote setting, out of sight can be out of mind. And if no one is explicitly following up with folks or getting decisions from stakeholders, projects can languish. Um, so make sure it's really clear who is driving each project. And everyone involved in a project uh, needs to know what their roles will be on the project. So a good best practice is to do a kickoff call on video when a project gets started and on that call discuss everyone's role and what they'll, they're going to be responsible for delivering um, and by when. Everyone should know their lanes and they should know everyone else's lanes as well. You'll also need to decide how you'll communicate as a group during the project. So you may decide that all major communication will happen on a Trello board. Uh, you may decide to use a combination of Trello and a project Slack channel to communicate. Um, our teams here usually use a combination of Trello boards, Slack channels, and other um, and regular Zoom uh, calls to communicate on projects. So the important thing is that people know what kinds of communication should happen in each channel. So for example, you may want to make sure that um, folks post all deliverables to the appropriate Trello card rather than to the Slack channel. You may want folks to ask questions in the Slack channel rather than cards to keep things moving quickly. It's really up to your team to decide. Just make sure you do decide on the communication norms and expectations for your project. Your remote projects will progress more smoothly as well if they're broken up into phases and each phase has specific tasks and deliverables. And it's important um, that you're very specific. And when I say you, this could be someone else on your team. I'm not saying that, you know, this is a top down management. I'm just saying these are the processes that need to happen. You need to give more than general direction, like build a campaign plan. Um, that's not specific enough to drive results and define the results you're trying to drive. Um, break that general direction into discrete pieces like define the audience, develop campaign goals, and design social ad creative. You'll want to create a separate card for each of those pieces and assign an owner and due date to it. So I have too many meetings is a complaint that most people have about work and I'm really sorry to tell you that that doesn't go away just because you're working remotely. Uh, while stand-up meetings can be effective to keep everyone on the same page, it's also sometimes just as effective if there's nothing to discuss uh, to update the status of projects asynchronously using team chat. So reserve meetings uh, to make decisions, to brainstorm, to prioritize together, uh, to problem solve together, and discuss touchy subjects or any real, any real discussion really should happen in a meeting. 
So when I first drafted um, a draft of this webinar, I didn't include a section about online training because we sell online training products and this is, webinar is absolutely not a sales pitch. Um, the purpose really was to share our remote work expertise and to help teams transition during this really unreal and stressful time. But ultimately, I did decide to, uh, that leaving out online training would not be helpful. Um, many companies are still relying heavily um, to this point on in-person training and now are struggling on how to do their training online. You still have to train people and in-person training is, is simply no longer an option for most. So I'm going to share a few tips on online training using our system rise.com as an example, since that's what we use. Um, hopefully these tips will be helpful though, regardless of the online training system that you use. So my first recommendation is to rethink what training actually is. A lot of folks tend to think of training as compliance courses um, that take months and months to develop and roll out. But we think of training as anything that's empowering to our people. And that can take on a whole lot of forms. Um, at our company, we use rise.com to create not only more formal training, but also quick how-to guides and interactive references, reports, and even presentations. The truth is that your subject matter experts have a lot to teach their coworkers. And if you think of training as wider than formal compliance training, it becomes a no brainer to empower everyone at your company to create content. And that doesn't mean you have to get everyone up to speed on instructional design. Uh, there's lots of training content SMEs can easily create without any instructional design, particularly if you have an intuitive online training system. And when you democratize uh, training, you build learning and knowledge sharing into the fabric of your culture. Uh, you'll have to check with your own training system, but I can tell you that in rise.com, it doesn't cost anything extra to let every user on the system create content. Um, and it's also super easy to create content for anyone. Um, at our company, it's been, I can tell you, it's been really impactful to unlock the knowledge sharing residing with our SMEs, subject matter experts. You can also get online training um, to your people faster if you leverage existing content that you have at your disposal. For example, uh, when we wanna create a course on a common business topic like communication, uh, we'll start by using the pre-built lessons in rise.com uh, that we then tweak to our heart's content. For a training course like this, about 75% of our course content will come from off the shelf training in rise, uh, off the shelf content in rise. Uh, it's great content and it lets us create training super fast. So check to see what you already have available in your training system uh, before you start creating content from scratch. As you move all your training online and give your SMEs uh, the power to create content, you're likely to quickly develop a significant uh, library of great training. And there are a few ways you can make that content e easy for folks to access. The first is to assign categories to training when you publish it to your library. Um, so that people can zero in on what's relevant to them. And another way uh, to get the training to the right people is to create groups that you can then assign training to. So at our company, for example, we have 14 different groups in rise.com. That way, if someone develops training relevant to just say the engineering team, they can just assign that content to the whole engineering group rather than having to assign it um, to each individual person on that team. A final best practice for online training is to create guided learning experiences for people. In rise.com and most other training systems, you do this using something called learning paths, um, and you can create bundled related courses together in a learning path in an order that will let learners go progressively deeper into a topic. So for example, you might have an onboarding learning path for new employees um, that has them first getting acquainted with the company and then later as they get deeper into that training learning, um, more about their role specific tasks. Okay, so I've covered a lot here on how to take your team remote, but let's talk a bit about you, the remote worker. Um, my team gathered their best tips from working with, from home, which I'll now share with you. Brian Batt, a QA lead here, suggests that you remember that just because you're using real-time chat, uh, like Slack, you don't have to respond instantly to messages. Let your colleagues know when you're gonna be unavailable so that you can focus on an important project, meet with others, or take a lunch break. In short, don't hold yourself accountable for instant responses and don't expect that from others either. Matt Winkler, a software development here, says that even if you're only um, the only one home and don't have any video calls, get dressed and make yourself presentable as if you're going into an office. 
Doing so helps shift your mentality from I'm hanging around the house, relaxing, um, to I'm going to the office to get work done. Kay Riggio, one of our friendly customer happiness specialists, uh, suggests that you take time to connect with your direct team and explore your company's offerings around building personal relationships with peers. At our company, we have employee resource groups for folks to connect, as well as channels for pretty much every topic you can think of <laughs> in the interest you can imagine, uh, music, food, wellness, and pets, uh, to name a few. Don O'Neill, a platform engineering here, says um, urges you to put your work away at the end of your day and don't come back to it until the next day. Make use of Slack's do not disturb hours uh, so you don't get pinged when you're not working. So last but not least, I want to talk about how you build community when you're working remotely. Your team is still a group of folks working together towards a common goal. And it's really important that folks feel connected and feel that their work has meaning and feel a sense of mutual accountability with others on the team. The foundation of community is a sense of shared purpose. You can create that shared purpose by being transparent around your goals as a company, particularly now in these tough times. Make sure your people understand how the things they're doing every day fit into your organization's overall goals, especially now. When you're transparent and communicate often about this, I think you'll find that your people will rally together in community. You can also foster community by creating a space for folks to be who they really are. Allow time and meetings for swapping personal stories. Encourage Slack channels focused on hobbies, personal discussion, or common interests. And you can even create team bonding events via Zoom or Slack. We're, as we're social distancing, um, these virtual connections become even more important. Our Articulate and Rise teams build a sense of community in many different ways. Some do holiday gift exchanges. Others have held video baby showers and virtual happy hours. And we even held a company-wide launch party on Zoom. You're going to need to find the, the things that fit with your company culture. Um, but the point is to not let rituals of connection go just because you're now remote. OK, folks, we've covered a lot of ground, um, but we received a ton of great questions from you all before and during the webinar. So I'm going to get to as many of those as I can with the time we have left. Um, but rest assured. I'll be writing a lot more about working remotely and about building a human-centered organization on Medium. So you can follow me there at Lucy Soros to get more of my thoughts on these topics. And um, let's start the QA here. All right, so some of the questions that have come in, Lucy, we have the first one. Uh, how do you balance workers' need for autonomy with a manager's need for accountability? Yeah, so I think this is really about um, a lot of the best practices around defining expectations and defining results um, and having clear communication channel channels for communicating the deliverables. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to micromanage every aspect of your folks work. That just means you have to set the expectations for results up front, set the expectations for the, the deliverables up front. But then your team can have autonomy and folks can have autonomy on how that they they go about and do that. Um, so I think it really there's one does not negate um, the other. That makes yeah. sense. And a follow up to that, um, someone else asks, you know, as a manager, then how can I check in on employees without without being overbearing or coming across as a micromanager? Again, I think this is really about setting up communication flows and a regular cadence. So. Um, it doesn't feel micromanaging if you have a one on one with your folks that you're um, are reporting to you once a week or once every other week or you have a standing like, hey, this is our part of our communication flow and updates on project is going to be you're going to post an update in Slack as the, on Fridays. Um, so whatever you do, you need to just um, you need to plan what those communication flows and those check in flows are with your folks. Um, and then it doesn't feel like you're just, you know, hovering over them virtually. Um, you have just a very clear communication flow that keeps you in constant communication with them about projects. Yeah. And if we could flip the coin, another question came in as a worker, then how do I demonstrate to my management that I'm being productive? Yeah. So this is, this is, um, this is a really good one um, and one of the pieces of advice I always um, give to new folks at um, at our company is 
be proactive about communication. Um, think about even, you know, you should have those set points where everyone agrees when, when you're reporting on what things are done and um, when things are delivered. Um, but as a, as, as an employee, what you want to do is be intentional about how am I sharing that value. So again, proactively reach out to your manager on Fridays, even if it's not, you know, if it's not set in your communication flow, hey, just to let you know, I'm working on these, I'm feeling good about this, this is going to be coming to your desk next, your, you know, your desk next week. Um, so again, a lot of this is about being really intentional um, about communication and making it part of your sense of this is what I'm responsible for. I am responsible for communicating with my team. I am responsible for communicating with my manager. Put that into your, like change your mindset around that so that you're taking your communication and proactive communication becomes part of how you, um, one of your standards for yourself about what it means to be successful is your job, at your job. Am I communicating well? Am I proactively communicating? Okay, great, I've got that piece of my job um, down well, but make that a requirement for yourself. Awesome. Uh, continuing on the communication theme, how do you encourage ideation and problem solving that often happens through office chit chat? Um, yeah, I think that, I think that there's a couple ways that happens. One again is being intentional and, um, and planning into project flows, those ideation um, steps so that folks can, can do that. You have that intentionally set up so that you know that's part of the process. The other thing is, is really, I think comes a lot of those informal connections are made when folks um, are just spending time together. You know, sometimes um, I remember when I first was early on at Articulate talking to an engineer would spark something, um, a marketing idea that was, you wouldn't have thought that I needed to talk to this engineer to come up with that, but there was something about that informal conversation that made that happen. But again, we were fully remote. That conversation was happening on Slack. That conversation was happening on check-ins um, or that conversation was happening on a coffee talk, um, which we do, by the way, we have informal chats where folks um, are paired up uh, randomly once a month and they will just have a talk about whatever they want to talk about for half an hour or an hour. Um, so you have to create just these spaces where folks feel comfortable reaching out to each other on chat, uh, Slack, chit chatting, where there's um, they're reaching out to each other to have um, informal times to get to know each other. Um, so really, again, it's about opening those, you know, spigots of communication in multiple different channels and kind of letting things breathe a little bit so that there are those opportunities for people to make connections as well. Uh, so speaking of those connections, a number of uh, topics came in, questions came in. Um, how do you stay connected and engaged with employees, maybe who are more introverted or shy? So um, I'm an introvert. <laughs> And uh, so I need a lot of alone time. And I actually, it was, it was hard for me to adjust um, when I first came to Articulate because it was so collaborative and there was so much interaction, even though that was happening on Slack at the time. Um, so I will say that having video, video calls and um, video calls can actually be a little bit of a challenge for introverts. Um, and so I think that really it's being, um, being attentive to your team's needs. You're going to have some introverts, some extroverts, um, and some folks are going to be more quiet on calls and they're going to want to follow up on things on Slack and they prefer that, that mode of communication. Um, so it's really about um, creating space where folks, you know, it's okay in your, in your culture for folks to have different ways of communicating um, and um, that you're creating space for that um, for for different folks. Awesome. I don't know if I answered Mike. Did I answer that question? I want to make sure I answered that. Did I miss anything there? No, I think we. I think you've got that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, along those lines, how do you build a team environment where employees feel safe and encouraged to share concerns? Uh, especially around their mental health and anxiety, um, you know, especially during these current times that we're experiencing now. Yeah. So um, I think it's really about the leaders and managers um, on the team. Um, it's our responsibility to be the ones to show vulnerability around those things, um, you know, to show in terms of 
uh, failure saying, oh, I messed up. Hey, hey folks, <laughs> I messed up on that. Um, for me to say that gives permission to other folks on the team to also say that. Um, for me to say, hey, I'm feeling anxious today because, hey, like I can't get out of the house and the walls are closing in. Um, that gives permission to other folks to, to um, be more explicit about that. And then also ask your folks, ask your team members, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And um, really our response and our ability to show up with um, compassion and presence uh, will, you know, doing that over and over again, your team's going to start feeling safer um, to do that with you. Awesome. Uh, let's flip it around a little bit, maybe on the more positive side. How do we celebrate success, milestones, life events, etc., as a remote team? So I, I, as I mentioned in the webinar, we do do things like um, we send people birthday cakes on their, or birthday cupcakes on their birthday. Um, we, so, you know, we do things around, you know, new babies, weddings, all of that. So we celebrate sort of personal things by, as a company, um, by, you know, sending little gifts or notes, whatever, flowers. Um, we also, a lot of folks on the team, if someone's sick, we just take it upon ourselves to send them flowers or, or whatever. Um, but we also really try to build in connection points um, around virtual, you know, having virtual um, wine time or whatever, um, having coffee talks, um, building in some of those, uh, those things that you would do in person, but you're just doing on a Zoom call. Um, we do that a lot. Uh, we also have a company retreat. I don't know, you know, how that's going to work when we're all at home, but hopefully things will look better around retreat time. But we do spend time, we do occasionally get together in person. So this is beyond just our current situation. If you're building a longer term remote team, um, it is nice to get together with people in person once in a while. And so we do do, um, we do do that as well. Great. Um, maybe a big, a, a big question speaking to what this is all about. Um, how do you maintain a sense of work-life balance in a work from home environment? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> um, and this is one that I, I struggle with. Um, and there's, you know, Don O'Neill, I think as the one who mentioned putting on Slack, do not disturb and really, you know, putting work away at the end of the day. Um, for me, I have found that it's helpful for me to have my day be more fluid so that if I can work early in the morning and, and later at night, um, then I, you know, have some permission during the day to go on a walk or whatever permission with myself. Um, so I, um, I think it really is about figuring out and checking in with yourself to make sure that you are, you are building into your schedule self-care um, and if you find yourself, you know, checking your phone or whatever at 10 o'clock at night to see what Slack messages came through or whatever, um, you need to just, you know, hold yourself accountable to that and really say, okay, I am not going to be looking at things, you know, put your, your phone in another room, um, close down your laptop. Um, it requires a little self-discipline, but it's really important, um, to take care of yourself, um, and to, uh, shut work off and really, really take a complete break from that. Um, so yeah, that's a hard one. <laughs> it, it, it requires a lot of intentionality, which is a word I've used a lot here. Well, and very much related, that is a follow-up question. Um, how do you minimize distractions while working from home, especially when the rest of the household is home as well? Yeah, so when I first started, well, one of the early in my working from from home um, career, my I had a, a daughter who was just like a year old, and our house basically had I worked from the end of the hallway, so it was open to the whole to the whole uh, household. Um, and really, it was about you know even with her being super little and her babysitter. Um, you know, letting them know, like, these are the times that I need quiet or, hey, I'm going to be on a meeting for the next whatever. I can't be disturbed. If you have a door closing it, my kids now, they know, you know, if my door's closed, I'm in a meeting. I'm not available. You can't come in. Um, so really talking to your family um, about what your needs are around um, certain times a day. It's more, it's okay to be walking in and having a quick chat other times a day you know, if my door is closed or um, if I have, you know, put a little note on your hallway, <laughs> like I'm in a meeting now. Um, so it really involves, uh, you know, setting a schedule and um, with your family and also just sharing expectations with them about what you need at this time. I know it's going to be hard for a lot of folks right now. It might not have private space. 
Um, but I do think those conversations can help um, somewhat. Yeah, and that was, that was actually one of the follow-up questions here for folks that may not have a dedicated office space at home. Um, mm -hmm. Are there some tips that, that, that we have to share with them? Yeah, I mean, using earphones can help if you're not on a call. Well, even if you are, do have to do a call using headset, uh, headphones can help block out noise. And, um, and even, uh, even if you're working in a space that's in a living room or something, just turning your back to the, you know, to the activity so you're not visually distracted by everything that's going on. So creating a little space within your space um, can help too, where you're just oriented away from all the activity, wearing headphones. Um, that can help as well. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else comes to mind. Those are my my key advice, and and then just talking to your family about what you actually need, and getting them set up. If you have small kids, if you have to do you know a meeting or whatever, you know get them set up on a project or something that really you know is going to engage them. You know they love Legos. Like now's the time to pull out that Lego set you've been saving that they haven't seen yet. Um, if you have something really important to do, so getting your getting your your folks set up in different ways um, to um, be occupied when you need to be um, occupied as well is a good idea. Great. And I think the the final question and it probably speaks uh, very much to what a lot of folks are facing right now is what is the biggest challenge most first time remote working employees face and how do we solve for it? <sighs> I think that um, a lot of folks who work remotely now, um, before now, I should say, have chosen to work remotely. They probably find that they're self-disciplined, that they're kind of oriented that way, that they find that they're way more productive in their own space. They may tend to be more introverted. Um, so was kind of self-selecting. So I think those folks are probably more like um, able to set up their day and um, are used to that. In this situation where you have people who wouldn't choose to work remotely, needing to work remotely, I think one of the challenges is really um, around, I'm at home, this is not work time, you know? So how do I organize my day so that it's about work and how do I be more disciplined about schedule? Um, so though that in those those quote unquote free times, maybe I'm not working, um, I'm not in a meeting. So this is my my productivity time. I'm really getting things done. Um, and I think that what can help around that is, again, to be intentional about setting a schedule, you know, calendar in <laughs> like, you know, for me, if it's not on my calendar, it's not getting done. So calendar in a chunk of time that says, you know, work on such and such um, so that you have a sense of you know, you're building a schedule that you are following um, and so that you can be, it helps with the discipline of just getting into that mode of um, and taking care of things. Um, so having a schedule, I think, can help a lot. All right, and I think that's, that's the, the majority of the, the most common questions that we've had. Great, and we are um, here at uh, a little after the hour, so we'll wrap things up. Um, Thank you so much for your great questions. Um, and if you didn't grab the link to the additional resources, don't worry, I will be sending that to you by email tomorrow. So keep a lookout. Um, and everyone, I hope you have a great day and don't forget to wash your hands a lot um, and take care. Bye-bye.